You know, back in 1972, when God really touched my life in Catherine Coleman's service, one of the first things that happened when I came back to Canada was he gave me a vision, a vision of Canada and fire for God in the scripture, Psalm 72, 8, that Canada's based on. He shall have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And for the first few years, I, you know, traveled sea to sea. And, and then God said, north, because you've got to do the ends of the earth. And so for almost 30 years, we considered the ends of the earth simply and only and entirely Arctic Canada and had a vision of seeing Arctic Canada blaze with the glory of God. And coming into the 1990s, I thought, you know, we're seeing it happen. I mean, whole communities were being touched. And then we found out that there were Eskimo groups in Russia that had never heard the gospel. And when 1994, we started going with teams of Canadian Inuit over to the far eastern part of Russia. But it was in 1997 that really we endeavored to go to the ends of the earth. The Yamal Peninsula, which is right at the very top of Russia, where we discovered there's a group of people who are the last nomadic Eskimos in the world. Still travel with the reindeer herds, still live in reindeer skin tents, wear their clothes, make their clothes in a reindeer skin and eat the raw meat of the reindeer. And they'd never heard the gospel. And so in 1997, we started going and, um, you know, we found out that you could reach some of these people. If you went to, uh, flew to Verkuta, which is very north, and then traveled out to Sovietsky, a little community, and then traveled however you could on the tundra, out maybe 20, 30 miles, you could find some of these precious people in the tents. And they were so welcoming to us. They just, in fact, one man said, we've been waiting for you. We knew there was a God and we didn't know how to get to him. And so we started reaching these people and going in the winter because that's when they came south. And, and um, then I realized we're only touching just a few of these people. Most of them are farther north, along the coast, along the Arctic Ocean, and they don't come south. It, and so, you know, I said, we've got to go. We've got to go farther. And uh, our workers said, well, there's no way. And finally, because God kept saying, go, uh, that I said, well, we're coming. And our workers got this tank, and we started traveling out that next year in the summertime in a tank visiting one family at a time out in the tundra, right at the top, in an area that in their language means the ends of the earth. And uh, I knew we weren't gonna reach big crowds. I knew we weren't gonna have big meetings. One family at a time. The largest group we had was 15 people. But they were coming to Jesus and it was, it was amazing. It was slow, it was difficult, but we were doing it. This one particular day, you know, we had our entire team there from Arctic Canada. And we're in the tank and we're bumping along hour after hour after hour after hour. And there's nothing out there. I mean, there's no trees, there's no bushes, there's no people. And finally, I'm thinking, what are we doing? We've spent so much money. We brought all these people all the way over here. We worked through all this red tape for what? And you know, you're getting tired and you're getting discouraged. And then the shout came, there's a tent. Well, I couldn't see anything. And they gave me the binoculars and I looked and, and there was a black dot. I said, I think it's a rock. And they said, no, it's a tent. And I was hoping they were right. So we started heading over to this black dot and it was a tent. Uh, great, you know, after many hours of, of doing this, we find a tent. And so I said, tell him to get his family and we'll have a service. And the man speaks to them in his language and, and the interpretation was, his family is about 20 to 30 miles over across the hills. He's here all alone taking care of almost a thousand reindeer. He's a shepherd. And uh, I think, oh great. And so the thought that I had was, well, we can't waste our time here. I mean, we've got to somehow be good stewards of this. And we've, so we'll, we know where his family is. We'll get the team in the tank and we'll go and reach his family. And one of our workers came and asked me a question that changed my life. That was the day that everything changed for me forever. And the question was, shall we serve the one? And when he said that, I just something hit me. I thought, I know the answer isn't no. We've got to. So I said to David Aglukark, one of our Inuit leaders, go get your guitar, David. And which meant we were going to have a service. And he said, really? And I said, really? So, you know, in North America, success is measured 
in um, numbers. The bigger the crowd, the more successful you're considered. We had a bizarre service. We had our entire team, all of us standing in a semicircle around a congregation of one man. And our Canadian Inuit sang their songs in a nook to tuck, and the guy just sat there, just staring at them, no emotion at all. And then they, they told about their culture, how many of them had been brought up in tents and igloos, and the guy just sat there looking at them. And then they told what Jesus had done in their lives, and their family, and their communities in Northern Canada. And the guy just looked at them. And so finally, they turned the meeting back to me, you know, and I think this is really bizarre. But if he slips out of the service, we'll know it because this is a small crowd. And um, I didn't know what to do. So I turned to Bruce Alexander, who was with us, and I said, Bruce, give him the gospel. Well, Bruce shared his testimony and it was interpreted. And the guy just sits there looking at him. <laughs> he had no idea what he was thinking. And then, and then Bruce preached, preached the gospel. And the guy sits there looking. And then much to my surprise, Bruce gave an altar call. And I say it, must, it could have been, well, it was the smallest meeting we ever had, but it was the most successful meeting because 100% of the crowd got saved that day. They really got saved. This guy just totally changed. He got happy, his eyes changed, he started laughing. And the worker who had instigated this by saying, shall we serve the one, said, have you ever heard about this before, about Jesus? And he said, no, never, first time. And I looked at him and said, you must be really important to God to have us come from the other side of the world for you. And he didn't argue, he just smiled, you know. And then I felt Holy Spirit say to me, if this was the only man out here, if there were no other families, if there were no other tents, I would have had you still come. I would have had you spend all the money go through all the red tape, go through all the endurance stuff that you've been through for this one. And the value of one soul, the value of one life just, I mean, it just became so real. How, the value that God places on a life. And I thought if he's that important to God, so am I. And if I'm that important to God, so are you. And then on the way home, I started reading the gospels and it was like I was reading it for the first time, reading that Jesus did this. He would leave Jerusalem and the crowds to go to Samaria for one woman that nobody else would bother with. He, he would leave the crowds in Jericho for one guy up a tree. He would leave the crowds by the seas of Galilee, the shores of the Sea of Galilee for one guy who was demon possessed on the other side. Shall we serve the one that changed my life? I don't look at numbers anymore.